Friends, what is the purpose and final goal of the noble life? The blessed Buddha once said, because if those of other sex and of other beliefs should ask you this question, friends, for what purpose is a noble life lived under the ascetic Buddha Gautama? When being asked that question, you should answer them in exactly this very way. It is, friends, for the fading away of greed lust and desire, for the breaking out of the mental prison of addiction, for the uprooting of the ingrown evil latent tendencies, for the direct experience of the supremely good method, for the destruction of the mental fermentations, for the enjoying of the fruit of certainty and total freedom for the sake of definite knowledge and penetrating vision, for the sake of final Nibbana without trace of clinging. It is for this purpose that this noble life is lived under the blessed Buddha. Then because if those of other sects should ask you, but what is the method for attaining a final Nibbana without clinging? Being asked that you should answer them thus, Friends, there is indeed a method. There is certainly a way for reaching final Nibbana without any cling. It is indeed exactly this noble, eightfold way. Right view, Samaditti. Right motivation, Samma Sankappa. Right speech, Samma Vajra. Right action, Samma Kamanta. Right life loop, Samma Ajiva. Right effort, Samma Vajama. Right awareness, Samma Sati. Right concentration, Samma Samadhi. This is the method. This is the way for entering the dimension of final Nibbana without clinging. When asked this question, because you should answer those of other beliefs in this very way. What then is the fruit of the noble way? How does the noble eightfold way make one noble? Having cultivated the noble eightfold way, a being might enter the stream which leads to Nibbana. Such stream entra Sotapanna is entirely freed from rebirth as animal, hungry ghost, angry demon, and the ultimate catastrophic destiny, burning hell being. Such noble one, such Arya, will be enlightened within seven rebirths, either as a human or as a deva. The stream intra has eliminated all egoism, all belief in a person or a self is eradicated, all eye-making and all mind-making is gone, abolished is all skeptical doubt in the complete perfect self-enlightenment of the Buddha and removed is silly superstitious beliefs in any benefit of empowerments and empty rituals. Such noble one have by direct momentary experience touched and tasted the deathless Nibbana and is therefore forever hereafter independent of any teacher. At this dream entry moment, right there and right then, as an internal light flash, right view emerges from wrong view and from all defilements as clear seeing. Right motivation emerges from wrong motivation as deliberately directing. Right speech emerges from wrong speech as kindly embracing. Right action emerges from wrong action as clever originating. Right livelihood emerges from wrong livelihood as full cleansing. Right effort emerges from wrong effort as enthusiastic exerting. Right awareness 
emerges from wrong awareness as illusion establishing. Right concentration emerges from wrong concentration as non-distraction. Externally, this kutabu, change of lineage, emerges from all symbols and conventions. This mental remodeling is an irreversible phase transition to the noble state. Path of Purification, Visuddhimaka, 681 Having cultured the noble eightfold way even further, one might attain the state of a once returner, Sakadakami, who is reborn only as a lower god, and then awakens in the next next life. When he returns here to earth as a human being, such fine noble friend has significantly reduced his sense desire and aversion. All bodhisattvas are Sakadakamis when they leave earth. For the two sit that divine dimension, for the contented life they enjoy just before their last human rebirth and final supreme enlightenment. Having further refined the noble eightfold way, a being attained the state of non returner Anagami, who is reborn in the higher fine material worlds, the pure abodes, where they may live for many eons and they attain Nibbana without ever returning to the human or lower divine worlds. Such noble one has entirely eliminated all sense desire and all aversion. Having fully perfected the noble a full way, one awakens as an Arahant, who is enlightened in this very life by elimination of all remaining mental defects, such as desire for fine form and desire for formlessness, the subtle conceit that I am, and any latent tendency to restlessness and all the remnants of ignorance. Such noble one enters at the moment of death, the ultimate freedom, the supreme bliss, and the imperturbable peace of Nibbana without any trace of clinging lift. Nibbana and Upatisesa. The Blessed Buddha once said, Bhikkhus, these eight things, when cultivated and refined, lead to the going beyond from this near shore right here to the far shore beyond all. What eight? Right view, Samaditti. Right motivation, Sama Sankappa. Right speech, Sama Vajja. Right action, Sama Kamanta. Right livelihood, Sama Ajiva. Right effort, Sama Vajjama. Right awareness, Sama Sati. And right concentration, Sama Samadhi. These eight things, when cultivated and refined, lead into the going beyond from the near shore, right here, to the far shore beyond all imagination. The welcome one, the supreme teacher, then added this. Few humans cross to that sublime far shore, beyond all being. Mostly, people just run up and down along this barren bank. Those whose praxis is like this, even an exact Dhamma, will pass on beyond the state of death to stilled harmony. Having left all the dark and evil doing, any intelligence seeks luminous light by leaving this turmoil, by going forth into solitary, sweetly silent homelessness. Secluded from lust, he experiences an unworldly bliss. Owing nothing, the wise and clever man thereby cleans himself of all these mental pollutions and defilements. Mentally, highly evolved by the seven links to enlightenment, delighting in non-clinging and relinquishment of all, such luminous ones, having quenched all fermentation, are completely raised, even right here in this world, that this noble eightfold way is the only method to cease all suffering. And what bhikkhus and friends is right view? 
It is because knowing such is suffering. Such is the cause of suffering. Such is the ceasing of suffering. And knowing such is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called right view. And what Bhikkhus and friends is right motivation, being motivated by withdrawal, by goodwill, and being motivated by utter harmlessness. This Bhikkhus and friends is called right motivation. And what Bhikkhus and friends is right speech, refraining from any lying, from slandering, from scolding, and refraining from empty gossip. That is called right speech. And what because and friends is right action. Refraining from all killing, from all stealing and cheating, and avoiding all sexual misconduct. This is called right action. And what because and friends is right livelihood. Here, because and friends, the noble deceiving, having given up all wrong livelihood, lives by right livelihood. This is called right livelihood. And what because and friends is right effort. Here, Bikus and friends, once makes a decision, makes an effort, steps up energy, exerts the mind, and strives to prevent the arising of unarising evil disadvantageous mental states. One makes a decision and strives hard to overcome any evil disadvantageous mental state that already have arisen. One makes a decision and strives to develop all yet unarising good advantageous mental states. And one makes a decision, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts the mind and strives to maintain and expand any advantageous mental state that already have arisen, not letting them fade away, growing them greater to the fulfilled perfection of development. This is called right effort. And what Bhikkhus and friends is right awareness. Here Bhikkhus one dwells considering the body as a group of mere form alert, clearly comprehending and aware, thereby ending all worldly urge and trouble. One dwells considering feelings just as assigned reactions, alert, clearly comprehending and aware, thereby ending all worldly urge and trouble. One dwells considering mind and mentality just as ever-changing moods, alert and clearly comprehending and aware, thereby ending all worldly urge and trouble. And one dwells considering all phenomena only as shifting mental states, alert, clearly comprehending and aware, thereby ending all worldly urge and trouble. This is called right awareness. And what Bhikkhus as friends is right concentration. Secluded from sensual desires, protected from any detrimental state, one enters and dwells in the first child full of joy and pleasure, born of solitude, joined with directed and sustained thought. Again, with the stilling and silencing of this directed and sustained thinking, one enters and dwells in the second jhana, calmed and assured unification of mind, in joy and pleasure, now born of concentration, which is empty of all thought and thinking. Again, friends, with the fading away of joy, one dwells in equanimity, just aware and clearly comprehending. Still feeling bodily pleasure, one enters upon and remains in a third jhana, regarding which the noble ones declare. In aware equanimity, one dwells in happiness. Again, friends, with the leaving behind of both pleasure and pain, as with the prior fading away of both joy and sorrow, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, a serene mental state of still, open, and completely clear awareness, purified by the equanimity of neither pain nor pleasure. This is my concentration. That because is called the way leading to the ceasing of all suffering. That because is called the way leading to the ceasing of all suffering. The noble, hateful way. Thank you. 
Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on Air number 71 recorded on the 28th July 2017 on Knuckles Mountain, Bamberella, Central Hill Country, Sri Lanka. There is one Dhammasala building report, one lotus offering, one simile and three questions. But first, the normal intro. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Worthy Honorable and perfectly self-enlightened was the best people. First off the bat, uh, remember to click subscribe down there on the small red sign and if you already have subscribed then click down there on the small bell uh, in the left corner to be uh, notified whenever a new video appears on this channel and if you like the video also click the thumb up sign so it's recommended to other beings also next up is med the meditation hall construction uh, video uh, we finished uh, half of the cement work uh, of the first quarter of the foundation uh, some days ago uh, and there will come a video about it uh, right now but first I'd like to say thank you to all the donors and supporters of this project and that support still is needed and can be given through what Buddha said.net and the video construction report of these very efficient three guys comes right here. Actually, when working with myself on this project of big building a meditation hall, I feel a great satisfaction because I know I do something good for others. And when you do something altruistic, then you also feel a great satisfaction. You are like lighted up by an inner fire and very become very happy and satisfied by doing this good. Knowing that many of the donors and many others also, of course, will come and meditate in this meditation hall for the next 20 years. This makes me very happy. So they can approach Nibbana. They can become more free, more happy, more peaceful, and have a greater insight into the absolute nature of reality. But uh, donations and support for this meditation roof for meditators that comes up here is very welcome uh, still. And it's this, uh, of course, enables them to approach Nirvana. And when you give somebody else the opportunity to approach Nirvana, then you get the very same thing back from the karmic mirror that reflects this good opportunity giving back to the donor. So this is worth remembering giving others opportunity to reach deathlessness thereby increases one's probability and ability to gain this very same deathlessness this very same Nibbana this very same irreversible end of suffering this very same lasting happiness oneself worth remembering is that so this is worth remembering, giving others opportunity to reach deathlessness thereby increases one's probability and ability to gain this very same deathlessness, this very same Nibbana, this very same irreversible end of suffering. Now this is my friend uh, Mr. Judy. We've been friends for 15 years and uh, so this means that he's uh, 105 years at least now 105 years He's blind on one eye, he has only one lung and he stopped eating I think he's on his very last round in the ring 
So is it with all beings. They turn gray, old, get broken teeth, become weak, stop eating and die. So is it. It's unavoidable. That's the problem. There's only one solution, is to be deathless. Let it taste me by. Mr. Judy, you have any comments? Prevailing comments? Huh? We'll meet again, Mr. Judy, down the road. Huh? Good friendship never dies. Some are about construction, then the lotus offering which was done in the name of Ruth, Mrs. the late Mrs. Ruth Camilo Roberti from somebody that loved her very much and that lotus offering uh, which was of two trays, more than 50 uh, red lotuses comes right here. Hello to you friends. This is the seventh Lotus offering uh, to the Lost Buddha's Tooth. And this is from somebody who loved very much Mrs. the late Mrs. Ruth Camilo Roberti. This offering is for her from somebody who loved her very much. And this will now go to an offer to Lord Buddha, tooth over in the temple, which lies over behind here, up towards the forest. Thank you. Thanks for complete. There is a lot of Buddhist begging bowl uh, deposited. And here we we'll also make a small offering.
Major offering, one has to say, a root, gamero.
Then comes the simile of the swimmer. It's from the Itibutaka, that was the set. The reference will be given below. So the Buddha said, ah, his existence is like being a swimmer. He's swimming out in a flood and he's drifting down towards a great lake. Uh, and he's uh, kind of careless, he's just swimming around out in this a very uh, swift drifting flood. Then a man stands inside on the uh, near shore and he shouts to him, I ah, don't drift by because there's a lake down there and there will be uh, crocodiles and uh, swirls, whirlpools that you'll be sucked down into and you will come to death or death-like suffering. Then the man, he strives with hands and feet until he comes back into the shore and can walk up in safety. So this is Great Lakes uh, with, the, with the whirlpools and the sharks. This symbolizes Kamaloka because there you're sucked down in this search for sense pressure. Sensing by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching and thinking and having intoxicated mental states. So these crocodiles uh, that are like anger and opposition towards various states and people and situations and events, various circumstances. They will eat you up from within because hate eats beings up from within. And the world's pools where you're sucked down, this is like uh, craving for sense pleasure, craving for this, craving for something to taste, something to hear, something to see, craving for sex, a craving for power, craving for money, craving for this and that, where one is sucked down. And the man uh, who is drifting by symbolizes uh, all the beings, all the sentient beings that are in samsara, that are still drifting by in this current of sense craving, craving for sensuality that gives a short moment of happiness, a short moment of satisfaction, but still leads to this enormous expanse of a very endless deep great lake with crocodiles. The man on the near shore that symbolizes the Buddha who shouts out to the disciple who is still drifting by there uh, that he should come in, follow the noble way, the noble eightfold way and then go upstream. And so the man now, he's turned around, now he's become a disciple. He's not drifting by, by social conventions and sense craving. He starts to work with hand and feet up against the stream, and then he saves himself and comes to the far shore, which is Nibbana. Most beings, the Buddha say, just run up and down the near shore. They never cross this flood of sensuality, of sense craving, this flood of becoming this flood of ignorance, which is so difficult to cross to the other side, which is Nibbana, lasting happiness, safety. So much for the swimmer. We go to the question, question number 211, and there are three of them. First one, is it said, it is said that when Mahamogayana was Mara Dusi at the time of Kakusanta Buddha, and he suffered 10,000 years in hell after that. Is that uh, earth years or hell years? That's earth years because the time uh, frame in hell is the same as it is in, in, uh, on here on the surface of the earth. <coughs> <coughs> what was the crime of... Uh, so it's worth noticing that in this very uh, same universe, because this Kakusanda Buddha was also born in this universe, uh, before Kasapa Buddha. So there's four prior Buddhas in this universe. There will be five one. Next one will be Metreya. Last one was Gautama. Uh, and then there's been uh, Konagamana, Kakusanta, and Kasapa. But uh, it's worth remembering that Mahamogayana, the left-hand disciple of the Buddha, uh, a great mystic uh, and an enlightened being, that he, in the very same universe as this, was the most evil being that uh, is found on uh, planet Earth, namely Mara, in this case called, called Dusi. And his, sister's, uh, his sister at that time was called Kali. And Kali had a son. And this is the Mara that is now. It is Kali's son. Uh, 
And he met actually Mahamogayana later uh, when the Mahamogayana told him that uh, when he he would also come to experience hell. Then when there's two uh, spears meeting from this side and from that side of uh, glow, glowing iron spears from this side of the chest and that side, they meet inside the heart. Then he has been there for a thousand years. So uh, he met his own nephew now in the opposite situation as a noble and as Mara, but he was Mara Dusi himself. He became Mara Dusi himself or fall, fall from that state uh, to the hill because he at Kakusanda was walking with a disciple and then he was very angry with the, that he could not affect neither the disciple nor the Buddha Kakusanda. So he took a pot shirt, uh, a broken uh, uh, clay pot and then hurled it uh, and hit the disciple in the neck, so blood was falling. And uh, then Buddha Kakosanda, he turned around with his whole body and said, there you don't know your measurement. And then he was sucked down into her Maratusi, right there on the spot. So he did something very, very evil. He went over his own limitations, uh, his probability limitations of uh, supporting his own existence as Mara. So he was a very high level at uh, 11, 11, and we are level five. So he fa fall all the way from 11, 11 to level one by this many other actions, also supporting actions. But uh, the, the final action that brought him there was this throwing a small pot shot and then causing a noble disciple to bleed. It is said that uh, in the hill he, he burned and there he had a bo uh, the body of a human and a f the head of a fish. Very strange. On the eight major hills and the uh, 128 minor hills, uh, I'll give two links below. Uh, it's the minor hills and the hill destiny on what Buddha said.net and it's both in the drops and the f drops four uh, series. And Mahamukhayana uh, Helmut Heger has uh, written a very authoritative work. Uh, it's real, uh, a Buddhist publication, Real Society, Real number 263, and I give the link here below. Question two. Are there t t different kinds of bodhisattvas? A bodhisattva or bodhisattva in uh, Sanskrit actually literally meaning uh, a, a, a awakening being. Bodhi, awakening, sattva, being, awake, an awakening being, meaning one who is destined uh, to enlightenment. Why so? Because they inspire, they, their intention is to be enlightened. So they deliberately try to do that with all their might. So the name is given to all beings who aspire to Bodhi or enlightenment, including Buddhas, Pacheka Buddhas, solitary Buddhas, and disciples of Buddhas or Buddha's disciples. Savaka Bodhi. So this means that. Uh, there's these three kinds of enlightenment. Enlightenment as a disciple, that is, you have to hear the method from a, Bo from a Buddha or from a Pachika Buddha or from an Arahat or from another person who has been in contact with one of these three. So you cannot do it by yourself. You're not self-enlightened. You're in disciple enlightened. Savaka Bodhi. So there are Savaka Bodhisattvas. It's not uh, usually Savaka the noble disciples or disciples who are not noble but still strive for enlightenment, they are not usually called bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are usually uh, only referred to the Buddhas, actually. But they are maha bodhisattvas. So they are also uh, these independently solitary enlightened ones, Pachika Buddhas. They, they teach you if you ask them, but otherwise they don't teach. They usually stay alone, but there can be more than one. They go to a cave where they meet together, if they're more than one, uh, uh, every fortnight up in uh, the Mulaka slope uh, in Himalayas. Uh, but otherwise, uh, not so much is known about them. They written the, uh, collectively written the Rhinoceros Horn poem from uh, the Sutta Nipata, uh, which I'll give the link to here below. Uh, and otherwise, they are fully uh, self-enlightened, but they're not perfectly self-enlightened like the next class, the perfectly self-enlightened one, the Samasambodhis. So there are three classes of enlightenment and therefore also three classes of bodhisattvas, uh, each heading for 
their own particular type of enlightenment. And the major, 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 major majority, uh, 99.9999 and 12 nines, or maybe more, is uh, Savaka Buddhists that needs, requires to hear the teaching from an enlightened one. Uh, then there's this Pashika Buddhist, the solitary Buddhas, uh, which are self-enlightened, but not perfectly self-enlightened. And then there's the Sama Sambodhis, the perfectly self-enlightened Buddhas, which is very, very, very rare. I'll give the link below to Enlightenment Bodhi, and on the Bodhisattvas, I'll also give you a link here below, uh, so you can see where you can seek uh, further information uh, about this issue about enlightenment and enlightenment beings, bodhi and bodhisattvas. Question three, do habits from past life follow so in the present life? The answer is yes, as Latin tendencies. Usually it's not, one is not conscious about it, but if, if one has liked yogurt, for example, in the last life, then one will also like yogurt in this life. Uh, if one was ill-tempered, uh, had a lot of uh, anger and irritation in the last life, then one will also have it in this life and so forth. But one can change it. But they, these defilement, mental defilements and very ingrown habits, they usually are very stubborn. So one has to work uh, very deliberately and effectively on them with the antidotes, specific antidotes. For example, universal friendliness against hate and irritation and uh, disgust meditation against greed and desire in order to uh, eradicate or change these uh, habitual behavioral patterns which is very ingrown uh, in the mind, and therefore survives transmigration, but usually cannot be remembered, like the re rest of the details, can only be remembered by small children from two to six, then they forget it uh, again. But there they are so immature that they cannot kind of like uh, describe their own uh, mental state as being predominantly hateful, or predominantly greedy, or predominantly ignorant. They cannot. But later in life, and especially during uh, development, mental development, during training, mental training, you can see patterns. When you start to see patterns of your former life, you can see these patterns go again and again. And at the moment of enlightenment, where one sees all one's life, 400,000 lives, then one can see these drifting patterns of recognition uh, and of both of good behavior and of bad behavior drift through all these existences as threads that are stitching together uh, one life with the next life, with the next life, with the next life. The perfect uh, habit will, of course, be the habit striving to develop the Noble Eightfold Way, because that leads to Nirvana. Uh, all other habits that are dominated by either ignorance, greed, or, or lust, uh, and, or hate, and anger, they will lead the other way, they will lead down. So it's a mixture of these threads that go through samsara that actually make up a being. We say that the, there's something called the vata, the round of the being. It's a being inside there. No, they're not. They're only these mental defilements that are coming again and again and again and keeping the being being in samsara. This is the black threads you can see that is uh, taking the, keeping the be being down. So it cannot attain enlightenment, come up in higher degrees of freedom and then high degrees of understanding and then eventually enlightenment. While there is this golden thread can be compared to following the Noble Eightfold Way, life after life, life after life, developing even further and even further and even further and even further. Like a divine ladder, you can say. So both good and bad habits uh, follow us uh, from past life to the present life and will follow us also in the future lives, unless we do something seriously about it, by Buddhist training. I hope this uh, answers the questions. Then there's question 112, a, a classic. How does one develop uh, the path, the noble earthful way, when one has a job and live in a secular world, constantly having to give up awareness and mindfulness because uh, one is immersed in the roles of work and uh, social life? Yeah, the, the code is, both for those who live the lay life and the, the monastic is sila, samadhi, panya. Sila, morality, samadhi, concentration, meditation, panya, transcendent understanding. The first uh, A, sila, that is moral practice and ethically correct behavior at all times. So these are five precepts at all times. 
and then the eight, eight precepts at Poya days. For the private precepts, see the link below, and there are also the eight precepts they are giving. It's just the five precepts plus three more. Then there's the Samadhi. This has the uh, consequence that the, when you uh, perfect uh, your, your morality, your ethical, then you have no standards, then you have no regrets and remorse. And this means that uh, you experience joy and happiness and gladness and no sadness because this regret and remorse is absent. And then uh, because this happiness, sukkha, is the proximate cause of samadhi, of concentration, of absorption, then one easily attains that state. One who's unhappy because of regret and remorse and secrets and pr having pretended something, and, uh, with a lot of secrets on their back, they feel very uncomfortable because uh, maybe someone will be discover their secrets. And then they will fall from their state in the social life. So they are not very happy and therefore they cannot attain uh, concentration. And when you cannot attain concentration, you cannot attain understanding, transcendent understanding of the absolute reality just as it really is because of this lack of concentration and this constant bombardment of distractions from all sides. So Samadhi uh, requires this uh, ethical sila, morality praxis first, and stands on the shoulders of that. And this will then, I would say for laypersons, 45 minutes daily uh, meditation, best from uh, 5 to 6 uh, a.m., and then with the correct meditation uh, objects, the correct kamatanas best provided by a monk. And I volunteer again uh, to give meditation objects to people if I can get a, a personal interview with them uh, once or twice. Or if they come up here uh, and, vi and ideally meditate and have a personal interview uh, in the meditation hall. Then this will develop this samadhi, this absorption, this practice of uh, meditation will develop into panya, transcendent understanding, also called wisdom. Uh, especially if supplied with the correct theory that th this is then considered and reconsidered and reflected upon thoroughly and again and again and again while sitting on the pillow. Therefore digging it deeper and making it more expanse, making it more intensive, making it more clear, this uh, understanding. Uh, so one has to have the theory uh, correct and this is to, for lay people to study of the five Nikayas. I'll th show them here pictures of them. The Dika Nikaya, the Majima Nikaya, Long discourses, the middle length discourses, Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses, Angutara Nikaya, the numerical discourses, and the Kutaka Nikaya, the uh, collection of minor texts. Uh, having studied that uh, in your life, and uh, then acted upon it, and then done meditation and purified morality, uh, and kept the poor days, then uh, I would say it's difficult to envision not uh, reaching a level that is higher than human in the next rebirth. But a significant uh, effort has to be done. I hope this clear this issue. Then there is a question uh, 213. Is it possible to attain jhana absorption with the practice of Anapanasati in today's world, especially the higher jhanas like the second, third and fourth? Yes, it is indeed possible. Uh, especially if one uh, study the right uh, teachers and get the right notification of what the words in the Anapanasati method, breathing meditation method. And I give two links below. I made both a, a visual video about it and I also made an audio uh, video about it. I'll give both links below. So uh, all four jhanas are possible, both for lay people and for uh, monastics. But uh, for both categories, again, the sila has to be from degree excellent to degree perfect. And that is difficult to attain and has to be so for uh, several years uh, upstream. So one has to make a significant effort. The sm smallest mistake will then induce a small degree of re regret and remorse. And then jhana is excluded for two or three months. Uh, major mistakes for two or three years. So, uh, you see, it's, uh, this sila, this morality, this ethical standard, keeping it high, keeping it completely clean, spotless, immaculate. This is the uh, lifeblood 
of this Buddhist method, because this is the only way to obtain this absorption, then then attain undistracted thinking that then leads to this transcendent understanding of the goal. So, first qualification, prior qualification is excellent or perfect moral standard over several years. Usually that's uh, where people fail, both monastic and lays. They cannot keep it clean, and it's not easy either, admittedly. Then there's 10 requisites, uh, and I also give you the link below on the, what Buddha said, a uh, net description of these 10 jhana requisites. The proximate acute momentary cause, right at the moment of absorption, is absence of sense desire, absence of ill will, absence of lethargy and laziness, absence of doubt and uncertainty. It's the five hindrances. They don't have to, they, they have to be absent. Then presence of directed thought, presence of sustained thinking, presence of thrill, joy, pity, presence of pleasurable happiness, sukha, and presence of unified, single-pointed focus. Ikkagata sitta, mind only going one place. So, this will, you can say, if you express that one factor, is, is happiness that is uh, the causal factor of absorption. Expressed as ten factors, then is full self-control gained by purifying morality. Two, guarding the sense doors at all times. Being moderate in eating. Being wakeful at night. Prior uh, life preliminary work with a meditation object, that one has been a meditator in a former life. Mastery in directed mind to the sign of the absorption. Mastery in attaining first calm and then unified focus. Mastery in determining the duration and advantages. I will be in jhana for one hour, for ten minutes, or whatsoever. Mastery in emergence from this exalted state. And mastery in reviewing the qualities of this state. When you have had a momentary or uh, long-lasting experience of jhana, or whatever concentration level, also... Uh, Kanika Samadhi, this means momentary concentration, momentary absorption. Then you review it and say, ah, what, how was it like exactly? How did I come to this point? And how did I emerge from it? How was it like when I was inside this absorption at whatever duration? Then the additional supporting qualities are clean body and clean dwelling place. If you're dirty, then it's difficult. And also if the place is messed up, it's also difficult. Skill in re remembering and extending the sign, the nimitta, uh, the samadhi nimitta, the sign of this absorption, how it was like actually. This is the sign, the remembrance of this sign actually, once you keep it. Because if you remember how it was during the moment of absorption, inside the absorption and how you emerged of it, how you came to there, then you can refine back to that sign and then refine absorption again. Many times it happens for uh, meditators that they gain some level of absorption and then they start to crave it. Then they sense desire because it's craving for a mental state. Then they uh, never attain it again in life. Or there can be years in between because they're craving for a particular mental state. It's basically sense desire. So this one shouldn't do. But one should remember at extending the sign, the memory of uh, this absorption. Skill in restraining the distracted mind. Skill in calming the agitated mind. Skill in encouraging the boring mind. The bored mind. Come on. Skill in observing the well-working working mind. Just looking on. Avoiding scatterbrained persons. People who are confused, non-meditators, avoid them. Frequenting well-focused friends. Those who are meditators, frequent them. Reviewing the liberation and jhanas and resolute determination to succeed. These are the necessary, sufficient and enabling factors acting as preliminary requisites for attaining the first jhana. So, as the ancient elders say, so guard the sign or count the cost and what is gained will not be lost. Who fail to have this guard will maintain taint, will lose each time what he has gained. 
And the requisite for Jana absorption, the link to that and what buddhaset.net is given right here below. So God design, preliminary first, purify morality, perfect or excellent sila, then take it from there. So God design or count the cost, and what is gained will not be lost. Who fails to have this God well maintained will lose each time what he has gained. Thank you for your keen attention, clever consideration and kind contribution. Thanks to all the Diakas, supporters and donors, both those who have given books lately and those who are supporting uh, the meditation hall regularly. Support for the meditation pavilion roof is still needed and donation is possible at whatbuddhasaid.net. Again, remember to click subscribe down there. It's very important. It's your ticket to Nirvana. And when you have clicked subscribe down there, then remember to click the small bell down there. So you are reminded, reminded to remember the Dhamma, the Buddha and the Sangha. Thank you, and have a nice and noble day. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Worthy, honorable, and perfect self-enlightened was the best Buddha. Thank you. Friends, what is this sublime right concentration? The Noble Eightfold Way leading to Nirvana is simply this. Right view, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right awareness, and right concentration. But what is right concentration? The Buddha explained the fourfold definition of right concentration exactly like this. Having eliminated the five mental hindrances, the mental defects that obstruct understanding, while quite secluded from sensual desires, Protected from any detrimental mental state, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, full of joy and pleasure, born of solitude, joined with directed and sustained thought. One makes this joy and pleasure, born of seclusion, drench, saturate, soak and suffuse the entire body so that no part of the body is unperfused by this intense joy and pleasure. Just as a skilled bathman puts soap powder in a copper basin and sprinkling it gradually with water whips it until the water soaks and pervades all the soap powder and making it into foam yet without dripping so too does a noble friend make the joy and pleasure born of solitude permeate and pervade this entire body. Again friends, with a stilling of directed and sustained thought, one enters and dwells in the second jhana, a calm assurance of unification of mind, with even deeper joy and pleasure, now born of concentration, devoid of any thought. One makes this exquisite joy and pleasure, born of concentration, drench, saturate, soak, and suffuse the entire body, so that no part of the whole body is unperfused by this profound joy and pleasure, just as a lake whose waters welled up below within itself and it had no other source 
neither by showers of rain nor from any river than this cool fount of water welling up from deep within the lake itself would immerse, fill and pervade the entire body even and exactly so the sun make this joy and place a bond of concentration infuse this entire body. Furthermore, friends, with the fading away of the joy, the noble friends dwells in even equanimity, just aware and clearly comprehending, still feeling pleasure in the body. One enters upon and remains in the third jhana, regarding which the noble ones declare in aware equanimity one dwells in pleasure one makes this pleasure apart from joy flood, saturate, soak and suffuse the body so there is no part of one's whole body unperfused by this pleasure divested of joy just as in a lotus pond some lotuses are born, grow and thrive, immersed under the water and the cool water soaks them from their roots to their tips. So too does the noble friend make the pleasure divested of joy, fill, flood and pervade this entire body. Finally friends, with the leaving behind of both pleasure and pain, and with the prior disappearance of both gladness and sadness, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, a completely still mental state of awareness, purified by equanimity of neither pain nor pleasure. One sits illuminating the body internally with his pure bright mind, so there is no part of one's whole body not illuminated by this pure bright mind. Just as a man was sitting covered from the head down with a white cloth, so that no part of his whole body was uncovered by this white textile. Even so does one sit encompassing this entire body with a pure, bright and radiant mind, so there is no part of one's whole body not illuminated by this pure, bright and luminous mind. Needless to say, friends, no trivial worldly pleasure can ever surpass such sublime bliss. The function of right our concentration and its associate is seeing right versus wrong concentration. As right versus wrong concentration is right view. Exchanging wrong concentration with right concentration is right effort. Right concentration functions as a drill, focusing, unifying and penetrating. Concentration thus induces an intense breakthrough into the Absolute. On how to attain the jhana absorption, search for jhana on what Buddha said.net. And for a further study on Buddhist right concentration, Sangma Samadhi, there's the jhanas in Theravada, Buddhist meditation, this wheel number 45.pdf or there is a path of purification, the complete manual on meditation and absorption, the path of purification, also free on what